we are uh, going to talk about uh, spin hall effect here uh, we'll talk about um, the segregation of spins on uh, transverse edges of the sample because of the, the passage of a longitudinal current uh, and here there is no requirement of an external field in fact uh, the role played by the external field uh, will uh, be played by another player which is an important player in this context which is called as a spin orbit coupling. So, we will come to that. So, uh, we start with spin hall effect. And uh, this effect has uh, a lot of uh, applications uh, in the field of spintronics which is considered to be the next generation devices uh, for communication and so on. Uh, so, uh, before we uh, embark on to the discussion of spin hall effect, uh, let us uh, just introduce spin or rather remind the audience about spin. Uh, spin is uh, actually a quantum mechanical object. Uh, it does not have a classical analog. In fact, uh, the closest quantity uh, in classical physics to spin uh, is the magnetic moment that we talk about. Um, in fact, uh, you can define a magnetic moment say for a current carrying wire a circular loop uh, which is I the current that uh, flows into the circuit uh, multiplied by the, the area of this loop which is I into A that is called as a magnetic moment. Uh, now, that is a purely classical description and uh, these uh, uh, suppose magnetic moment is a vector because of the, uh, the area being a vector uh, here we just talked about you know the magnitude of the current. So, it is a, a current into the uh, area vector which uh, of course, is uh, points up. So, if, if this is the uh, loop which carries a current I uh, then uh, the area it encloses is given as A and uh, this uh, has a direction. So, this is the direction of the area which is perpendicular to the plane of this um, circular loop and so, m is given by i into a. Now, suppose this is uh, a is a vector and that is how we can write m as, uh, as a vector. So, m uh, say in a Cartesian coordinate system uh, has uh, these components m x, m y and m z. Uh, so, a will have components uh, in various directions. Of course, in this direction when it is placed in the uh, x y plane then it is along the z direction, but in general it will have components. Now, um, these are just classical vectors with no constraint on uh, these components or the measurement of these components, but we know that uh, spin uh, in quantum mechanics uh, they follow a commutation relations. The, components follow a commutation relations which can be um, combined into uh, this relation. So, this is the commutation relation of spins. Uh, which what it means is that uh, you have a uh, uh, Sx, Sy this is equal to Ih cross Sz or it can be written as uh, S i uh, S j uh, the commutation is i h cross S k okay? where i j k are x y and z in a clockwise fashion. So, if you write down uh, i j and k on the periphery of a circle then uh, it is only clockwise if you break the clockwise property. Uh, then you would get a minus sign that is uh, S j S i commutator is minus i h cross S k because you have broken the clockwise uh, notation here. Okay. The spins are of course, also the generators of rotation. And in fact, uh, the rotation operators can be uh, represented by the spin vectors and um, just that uh, in a very similar manner that uh, the rotation finite rotations about different axes they do not commute. Uh, 
and this is a direct you know directly related to the fact that the components of S do not commute as well uh, which is what uh, you have just seen here. So, uh, what is important for us are these uh, spin half particles uh, which are nothing but electrons. Uh, so, these electrons uh, so, there is a, a special notation that is used for the spin half particles or the electrons and these are called as a Pauli matrices. So, S is written as um, you know H cross by 2 and sigma and uh, where S is a spin vector and uh, sigma are the Pauli matrices and these sigma so, these are Pauli matrices and they have components such as sigma x, sigma y, sigma z and so on. Okay. So, uh, these are the Pauli matrices that one talks about and they have very interesting properties. So, let me enumerate some of the properties of the Pauli matrices. So, uh, one of the properties is that this each of these uh, the square of them is equal to 1. So, uh, for i to be uh, you know x, y and z. So, sigma x square equal to 1. Now, this 1 is the identity matrix. So, just to clarify things this is equal to 1, 0, 0, 1. Okay? So, this is true for all of them and uh, each of these sigma x is written as 0, 1, 1, 0. Uh, sigma y equal to 0 minus i i 0 and sigma z is equal to 1 0 0 minus 1. Now, this is a convention uh, that uh, the sigma z is diagonal and in that basis uh, sigma x and sigma y are off diagonal. Uh, if you want to make sigma x to be diagonal then of course, uh, sigma y and sigma z to become off diagonal. But this is the standard notation for the Pauli matrices. Okay? Uh, though as any matrix can be diagonalized, so you can also diagonalize the uh, off diagonal matrices namely the components x and y. If you do that then the other two become uh, off diagonal uh, and uh, but of course, uh, this is uh, we will carry on with this uh, notation. Number 2 uh, the trace of sigma i is equal to 0 which is seen here you see the sum of the diagonal elements is uh, equal to 0. So, all of them uh, have this property and uh, 3 is that the determinant of sigma i is equal to minus uh, 1. So, this is a determinant and if you can check that that the determinant is uh, 0 into 0 minus 1 into 1 which is minus 1. So, each one of them uh, have a determinant which is equal to minus 1. Uh, you can also check that the eigenvalues uh, of each one of them are plus and minus 1. Uh, each one of them is a Hermitian matrix even though you see that sigma y has complex entries or imaginary entries rather, uh, but uh, that does not matter they all three of them are Hermitian matrices. So, there is another very interesting property that uh, any 2 by 2 matrix uh, that is say comprising of 4 entries say A, B, C, D and they can be written in terms of the Pauli matrices. Pauli matrices and and sigma 0 which is an identity matrix or you can call it a 1 that we have written earlier. Okay. So, uh, 6 would be uh, very interesting commutation relations and anti commutation relations as well. So, this is equal to 2 i epsilon i j k. Uh, sigma k and uh, so this is epsilon i j k is called as a Levi Civita tensor and it has a property that uh, if i j k are 
cyclic that is uh, you know they are in this particular order that is uh, their clockwise order or uh, these i j k then epsilon i j k is equal to 1. So, if you break it once so let us say j i k then it becomes minus 1 and uh, uh, epsilon i i k is equal to 0 that is uh, if you break the cyclic property it will pick up a negative sign. However, if you make them both of them same uh, or at least two of them same uh, with the other one to be different uh, then uh, this is equal to 0 that is the property of this uh, thing. So, uh, it, it can be expanded as sigma x sigma y uh, this is equal to. So, now I have everything um, this epsilon i j k equal to 1. So, this is equal to sigma z. Okay. Uh, and of course, if you take sigma x, sigma x commutation that has to be 0 because it is sigma x square minus sigma x square and that is coming from any two of the three indices uh, are same. Okay. So, another one is the anti commutation relation and which is sigma i sigma j uh, this is equal to 2 or uh, delta i j 1. Okay. Now, this very clear anti commutation means that they sort of add up. So, suppose the sigma x sigma y uh, then of course, this is equal to 0 and if you have sigma x sigma x or sigma y sigma y then it is equal to twice into the identity matrix okay? and which we have uh, already seen that a sigma x square or a sigma y square or a sigma z square is equal to 1. So, you are adding 2 of them that is sigma x square plus sigma x square which should give you 2. So, that is one of the uh, another property. Uh, Let us say another property is um, sigma i sigma j this is equal to delta i j and uh, 1 and i epsilon i j k sigma k. Okay. So, this I am just writing 2 of them the product of 2 of them can be written as this. See, if uh, sigma x, uh, so if i and j are same, say it is equal to x, uh, then the first term will survive because uh, i equal to j it survives. Uh, so, that will give you 1 which is all what you know and if i is not equal to j that is uh, uh, if sigma i is equal to x and j equal to y then the first term becomes 0 on the right and the, this term the last term survives and that is equal to i uh, epsilon i j k will give you a 1 uh, and will give you a uh, z sigma z. So, sigma x sigma y is equal to i sigma z and that can be proved uh, from 6 and 7. So, if you combine 6 and 7 uh, then you get 8. So, what I mean by that is uh, uh, say suppose 6 is equal to sigma x sigma y minus sigma y sigma x is equal to uh, 2 i sigma z and um, uh, from 7 one gets a sigma x sigma y plus a sigma y sigma x is equal to um, 0 because i is not equal to j. If you sum both of them uh, then uh, this cancels and you get a 2 sigma x sigma y equal to 2 i sigma z and this 2 will cancel and you get a sigma x sigma y equal to i sigma z is exactly what I said in 8. Okay. And uh, uh, as a last one in various situations uh, one actually needs to take the exponentiation of the Pauli matrices that is uh, it is an exponential i theta, theta is a rotation angle and it is n dot sigma where uh, n cap is actually a unit vector pointing in any direction. Uh, you can take it as a special case to be either along x, y or z, but it does not matter you can take it in x, y and z directions in any arbitrary direction and then this is written as a cosine theta uh, 1 plus i uh, n dot sigma sin theta. Okay. So, this is the formula for this uh, the Pauli matrices are taken to the exponents as I said n cap is an arbitrary uh, unit vector uh, unit vector pointing in an arbitrary direction theta is some angle and sigma uh, is a Pauli matrix. So, if you take um, n cap to be along the z direction 
then it becomes equal to sigma z. So, we will have to expand exponential i theta sigma z which will become cos theta into the identity matrix plus i and n dot sigma will simply be sigma z. So, it is i sigma z sin theta. Okay? These are some of the properties of uh, spins and why I introduce them is because that we are going to talk about spins now which we have ignored so far uh, while talking about quantum Hall effect. So, uh, let us go back to the discussion of uh, spin Hall effect. So, and uh, it is abbreviated usually as she, uh, you will see another uh, called as a I she, which is inverse spin Hall effect. So, let me write a few salient features. So, a uh, spin Hall effect or she uh, refers to the generation of spin current perpendicular to to an applied charge current. So, what is a spin current? Uh, we will just see in a while uh, through some illustrative diagrams. So, it is basically the when the, the charges uh, get segregated, there is a generation of a voltage and here exactly in the similar manner, the spins will get segregated and that will give rise to a voltage and this uh, voltage creates a current and uh, we will talk about spin current in just a while. And um, so, this is uh, the called as a, the spin hall effect. So, it leads to accumulation of spins of opposite kinds that is up and down spins at the edges of the sample. just like opposite charges they accumulate at edges of the sample. Uh, so, as I said that there is no requirement of a magnetic field. So, the spin orbit coupling magnetic field and uh, and yields spin selection that is how the up and down spins understand that they have to move to the uh, opposite edges of the sample and that's dictated by uh, spin orbit coupling and in some of the, the doped semiconductor spin orbit coupling is quite strong and um, they can be used in order to give a spin polarized current or a spin hall voltage uh, etc. <coughs> we will we'll come to that in just a while and uh, so let us um, look at some of the pictures of the hall effect or the spin hall effect. Uh, so, this is uh, basically a cartoon of the family of hall effects that are being you know talked in various forms in this course. So, this is the usual hall effect in your left uh, that is the hall effect there is a current that has been sent in this direction uh, the direction is shown here and uh, there is a magnetic field which is uh, perpendicular to the plane of this sample and the positive and the negative charges they separate giving rise to a hall voltage. So, if you connect here a voltmeter, it will show you a voltage because of this uh, charges uh, migration of the charges and so on. Now, if you uh, do the same experiment, but not in presence of magnetic external magnetic field, but suppose it is a ferromagnetic sample, which means that it has a magnetic moment by itself. So, magnetic moment is equivalent to uh, an effective field external magnetic field uh, this because of this magnetization I mean the magnetization of the ferromagnetic sample uh, again there will be the charges will be segregated on 
the two edges of the sample or the transverse edges of the sample giving rise to a voltage and hence a current and then one can see Hall effect. There is no requirement of an external field, but the magnetization of the sample plays the role of the field. And the last one, the one that is on your right, you see that there is a spin selection that takes place and the down spins which are shown in red, uh, they come and accumulate in the left edge of the sample whereas the blue ones which are the up spins, they accumulate on the right edge of the sample. Okay? So, the Hall effect we know that uh, the magnetic field produces uh, charge current, the anomalous Hall effect which we have not discussed, but is basically happens in ferromagnets or uh, it is observed in ferromagnets. So, it is Hall effect in ferromagnetic material and spin Hall effect uh, where the, the current, the charge current which is JC in presence of a spin orbit coupling uh, produces a spin current. Okay? And uh, you also see that this is called the I C or the inverse spin Hall effect. This is a sample and then there is a spin polarized current. If you send a spin polarized current uh, which is shown by J's, uh, that gives rise to uh, the transverse charge current flowing into the sample. Okay? So, that is called I C or inverse spin Hall effect. All right. So, these are very short introduction of the Hall effect. Uh, let us do some calculations uh, in order to understand uh, things better and in a more detailed manner. Let us start with spin orbit coupling, which as I said is one of the main ingredients of uh, the spin Hall effect and such effects will uh, eventually if, if the spin orbit coupling is strong will give rise to spin polarized current and uh, we can the spins can then be manipulated uh, to carry information which is otherwise is done by the charges. Now, these spins uh, etcetera they do not have any joule heating, uh, they are not scattered by impurities you know there will be no loss of information because of dissipative effects uh, coming from various agencies that we see in the electronic devices. Uh, so, the spintronic devices will be immune to most of those uh, effects uh, that reduce the performance of the electronic devices or the components. Okay? Now, in order to understand uh, spin orbit coupling in a simple manner, let me um, sort of give you the example of uh, H atom, the hydrogen atom. Okay? which is uh, one of the things that everybody does in a uh, course of quantum mechanics, the first course of quantum mechanics where uh, you are required to solve the Schrodinger equation uh, in presence of a Coulomb potential which is uh, 1 over r attractive Coulomb potential. I mean uh, the Coulomb potential is attractive which takes place between, uh, so this is the uh, atom and there is a, uh, there is a nucleus uh, which has a proton and is positively charged and there is an electron which goes round it and there is an I mean uh, electrostatic attraction which goes as minus uh, say for example, E square over R okay? or you can write it Z E square over R in more complicated atoms uh, where the nuclear charge is given by Z E instead of E where Z uh, denotes the, uh, the number of components that you have in the nucleus or the atomic number uh, so to say. So, uh, in such a hydrogen atom, the electron actually goes around the nucleus and uh, it, it moves in a circular orbit and from Bohr's law, we know that this orbit is stable even though it is a charged particle moving in a circular orbit, it does not uh, emit radiation in certain uh, selected orbits uh, which are known as Bohr orbits and in these orbits, the angular momentum of the particle or the or the electron or the charge is quantized as uh, n h uh, okay, where n into h, h is a Planck's constant. So, uh, that is Bohr's assumption which is of course, correct because uh, had it not been correct uh, nothing would have you know exist in, in nature. So, uh, this um, electron is of course, as I said is in moving in a circular orbit. For a moment consider only a rectilinear motion of the electrons.
and you might say that uh, if it is moving in a straight line how would that uh, you know be corrected for since it is actually moving in a circular orbit. And it turns out that the correction is trivial is just a factor of 2 uh, which we will ignore because the calculation becomes simpler if you take a rectilinear motion. Uh, you see what I am going to do with this, uh, this whole picture. So, in the uh, rest frame of the electron the proton is moving with a velocity minus v. Suppose the electron is moving with a velocity plus v. So, in electrons rest frame proton moves it moves with a velocity minus v ok. So, this is very clear. So, suppose the electron is in rest then the proton would be moving with a velocity minus v and um, proton of course, has a charge plus e, e being the magnitude of the electronic charge and um, so, a moving charge produces a magnetic field at a distance at a certain distance. Now, uh, because of this presence of the charge moving which constitutes a current and that will give rise to a magnetic field, the electron will feel that magnetic field because of the motion of the proton ok. And uh, this magnetic field can be easily obtained from the Biot-Savart law which is really given by So, we are really doing classical electrodynamics and uh, there is no quantum mechanics there, it is just that system is quantum mechanical which we know for sure because it uh, exhibits uh, bound states with energy you know minus 13.6 divided by n square where n is called as a principal uh, quantum number. <coughs> so, from Biot-Savart law the magnetic field that the proton produces at the location of the electron is e b equal to uh, mu 0 over 4 pi and i and a d l cross r divided by r cube ok. Uh, all these are the notations are clear to you uh, mu 0 is called as a permeability of free space i is the current and d l is the small element of length etcetera r is of course, the distance uh, where or the location where you want to calculate the magnetic field and this distance is just the distance between the proton and the electron because of the motion of the proton it produces a magnetic field. We want to understand that what is the magnitude of the magnetic field uh, that the electron experiences uh, because of the motion of the proton. So, I d l uh, which we have just written is nothing but equal to minus q v ok, where minus q is the charge of the electron. So, then b becomes equal to uh, minus mu 0 over 4 pi and a q and a v cross r divided by r q ok, uh, because there is no differential term here. So, we write it a full b and this is the, uh, the magnetic field that the electron fields a q being the electronic charge magnitude of the electronic charge and uh, uh, there is a proper direction has been taken into account and uh, it is of course, uh, this magnetic field is uh, in a, a direction which is perpendicular to the uh, plane uh, I mean to both v and r and r if you like is really the uh, this distance ok. Now, because of this the whole thing is in motion the system is in motion and uh, there is a magnetic field. So, there will also be an equivalent electric field or because of this uh, magnetic field there will be an electric field which is given by so corresponding electric field is given by So, E is equal to Q cross R divided by 4 pi epsilon 0 R Q. Uh, this is basically the static electrostatic field 
uh, which is because of the point charge at a distance r q is of course the charge of the nucleus that is the charge of the proton okay so uh, you can see that if you compare e and b you can find that the b is actually equal to minus uh, mu 0 epsilon 0 uh, v cross e so this is the standard relationship between the b and e uh, so this is equal to minus v cross e and if you remember that mu 0 epsilon 0 is nothing but equal to c square okay so this is the form of the magnetic field in terms of the electric field uh, so once we get this so b is equal to minus 1 by c square and I write v vector that is a velocity vector as p over m and this is equal to I write this q square as or rather q as uh, z d uh, it is r cube into r vector where we have written q over 4 pi epsilon 0 that is a standard thing as z d but for hydrogen atom z is equal to 1 so you can write z equal to 1 as well. So this is the form of the magnetic field who feels the magnetic field the electron feels the magnetic field because of the motion of the proton in the rest frame of the electron. So if you simplify this this is equal to minus z d divided by m c square um, r cube and then there is a p cross r and this is equal to uh, if you remember r cross p is equal to l and that is p cross r equal to minus l. So, this minus sign gets absorbed and one gets a l. Okay. So, this is a b uh, gives rise to an angular momentum uh, because of the uh, magnetic field being present or the magnetic field can be expressed in terms of the angular momentum of the electron. Okay. So, a spin orbit Hamiltonian h is equal to minus mu dot b and where mu is the magnetic moment and uh, this is written as g into e over 2 m s that is equal to so mu is equal to g into e over 2 m where g is called as a Landy g factor. and this has a value which is very close to 2. So, this becomes equal to E over m with a minus sign into s. Uh, so, the h becomes equal to so this is s dot uh, b. Uh, so, this is like s dot b and b we replace it from this equation 1 say for example and uh, so if you do that then it becomes minus E by m into z e divided by m c square r cube and then there is a l dot s okay and this is equal to uh, there is a minus sign which i have missed here so this minus becomes plus so this becomes equal to uh, z e square divided by m square c square r cube and l dot s so this is called as a spin orbit coupled or spin orbit coupling Hamiltonian. So, that means that uh, the uh, momentum or the or orbital angular momentum is uh, locked with the or coupled to the spin angular momentum. So, uh, this is like L x s x plus L y s y plus L z s z and a direct consequence of such terms in quantum mechanics it says that uh, neither uh, L, neither components of L or S commute. Hence, L and S are not good quantum numbers.
instead of L and S I should write it as uh, L and S uh, which are quantum numbers corresponding to the vectors or these operators L and S. So, that is very clear uh, why that happens because um, L and S uh, have components L X, S X, L Y, L, L S Y and L Z, S Z and uh, we have been taking in order to express the eigenfunctions of the hydrogen atom we have taken um, the two operators such as L square L Z you know set of good operators which give rise to the L quantum number which have you know eigenvalues as this and this respectively. So, L into L plus 1 h cross square and m h cross where L was considered to be a good quantum number that is orbital angular momentum quantum number and m is the let us write it as m l corresponding to the, the orbital angular momentum. So, this is the magnetic quantum number m l corresponding to L and so on. So, these were taken as the uh, good quantum numbers and um, uh, the Eigen functions were y l m uh, let us write it as l and um, now with if this l x and s x these Hamiltonian would involved l x s x plus l y s y plus a l z s z. Now, this term will not commute with l z and the reason is that L z will not commute with either L y or it will not commute with L x. Okay. So, this ceases to be a good quantum number. So, not a good quantum number and because it is not a good quantum number uh, you cannot use uh, this set to be or rather this set to be the, the set of operators that can be used in order to uh, formulate the problem. But um, fortunately, there is a, a simple solution to that. One can actually use a j which is equal to j equal to L plus s and one can actually use the eigenfunctions corresponding to j uh, which are in quantum mechanics they are written as j and m j. And because of this if you if you really uh, square this up uh, then L plus s it is square. Uh, so, that tells you that L, L square plus S square plus 2 L dot S and, and 2 L dot S have eigenfunctions which are J into J plus 1 H cross square minus L into L plus 1 S, uh, H cross square minus S into S plus 1 H cross square. So, this L dot S has an eigenvalue which is equal to half of this. Okay. So, th this is known. So, for L equal to say 1 and S equal to half uh, then uh, your J will become equal to 1 I mean this it is right like, like half. So, this is L plus S. Uh, so, this is equal to half and 3 half. So, you can put J equal to uh, 3 half which will be the excited state and uh, J equal to half. So, this will be like half into uh, I mean 3 half into 3 half plus 1 half into half plus 1 and so on and this is of course 1 into 1 plus 1. Uh, h cross square and half into half plus 1 h cross square and you can easily find the uh, eigenvalues of these things. Uh, uh, this operator has uh, two possible states. So, uh, in presence of the spin orbit coupling the states which were earlier degenerate now splits up into these two states and there is uh, going to be a, a sort of energy difference between the states. Okay. Uh, in uh, plain and simple language this is the, the spin orbit coupling. Uh, let us talk about a specific kind of spin orbit coupling that is important for these spintronic devices or the spin hall effect that we are going to talk about. And these are uh, very specific low dimensional materials and since we are talking about two dimensional material these uh, spin orbit coupling are 
important. So, these spin orbit coupling are known as uh, the two of them and we will only talk about one, uh, the other one is not uh, very uh, difficult or very different. Uh, so, they are called as the Rashba uh, spin orbit coupling. So, let me write it as SOC, SOC means spin orbit coupling and also Dressel has Dresselus SOC. Uh, we will not talk about Dresselus and we will only concentrate on the Rashba. Does not mean that it is not important, it is important in certain um, doped semiconductors, uh, but um, in the context of two dimensional materials such as graphene the Rashba spin orbit coupling, uh, even though the magnitude is very small, but it can probably be tuned using an external uh, gate voltage. So, that is why it is important. So, uh, you know in uh, <coughs> really uh, in solids, uh, the electrons really do not feel any uh, strong um, attraction uh, from the nucleus, uh, you know because uh, uh, it, it gets screened. Uh, but uh, the electrons can still uh, face a field, an electric field uh, or a potential gradient due to the internal effects. And um, these uh, gradient of the field when this electrons um, feel this, I mean gradient of a potential, gradient of a potential is nothing but a field, electric field and this uh, the charge of the electron couples to this field and will give rise to observable effects. And these uh, spin orbit coupling uh, can be quite strong uh, in certain materials, particularly in doped semiconductors. Mm, unfortunately, it is very weak uh, of only a few MeV uh, with small m uh, in graphene and that is why graphene even though it had prospects of um, using it as a spintronic device it still uh, cannot be used uh, so because of this uh, reason that we have just talked about. But otherwise in uh, uh, semiconductors such as uh, indium arsenide or indium gallium arsenide etc., it, it can be strong. So, let me um, tell you that what is Rashba spin orbit coupling and so on. Okay. So, uh, we have a two dimensional plane. Okay. So, it is just like graphene, graphene is two dimensional. Uh, it is in a plane and uh, these uh, sort of is usually you know which we have discussed earlier that uh, they are um, uh, grown on substrates which could be SiO2 substrate and so on. So, this is usually for graphene it is SiO2, but there can be other substrates as well. So, this is where the graphene is or other 2D Dirac material say for example. Now, uh, there is of course, a surface inversion symmetry being lost. And because of this surface inversion symmetry being lost, what I mean by surface inversion symmetry is the following that uh, below the graphene layer, uh, there is a SiO2 matrix or uh, the substrate and above that it is air. So, uh, or say vacuum. So, the above the graphene layer and below the graphene layer, the environments are very different and this is what is meant by uh, the inversion symmetry being broken. And in such a situation, the spin orbit coupling that can take place is called as a Rajba spin orbit coupling. And let me sort of do a little calculation and to find out that what is the form of this and how it can affect various quantities or rather various the physical properties uh, with regard to the spin resolved transport. So, uh, because of this Rajba, so Rajba is a name of a Japanese uh, scientist who discovered this. Emmanuel Rashba. Uh, so, this is equal to a minus mu dot b. So, this is the magnetic field and uh, we have just seen that uh, that this can be written as a v cross e by c square from our earlier calculation. So, this is nothing but equal to e e h cross divided by m c square where mu is taken as um, mu is equal to the E b over uh, I mean E e over 2 m into h cross into s that is the magnetic. Uh, so, this is s dot uh, v cross say z cap. So, this is the 
a spin. So, mu is equal to um, E over uh, 2 H um, S into G and this could be G could be equal to 2. Uh, the electric field is uh, taken to be in the z direction. So, we have taken the electric field to be in the z direction and then you have a s dot uh, v cross z which can be written as uh, e e uh, h cross square divided by 8 pi square m square c square uh, sigma dot uh, k cross uh, z cap where uh, v is equal to uh, written as h cross k over m and this can be written as uh, some alpha which is the strength of the coupling and a z cap cross k dot sigma. Uh, there was a minus sign here and I have changed the sign in the last step. So, this is the form of the Rajpa spin orbit coupling uh, and uh, so this is nothing but it looks like a vector coupling, but it is not because z cap cross k uh, will be a vector and then a dot it with the Pauli matrices. So, we have used s is equal to h cross by 2 sigma as well. So, that is how it is written in terms of the Pauli matrices. Uh, so, this uh, alpha is the uh, strength of the spin orbit coupling. Okay. So, this is equal to E E h cross square divided by 8 pi square m square c square and into E. Okay. And now, you see that it depends upon the electric field which uh, can be uh, now an external gate voltage can be applied in order to uh, change this or rather this uh, tune this value of alpha. So, alpha can actually be increased and as uh, several organic electrolytes etcetera are being used or add atoms like uh, on the graphene matrix there are heavy add atoms such as gold etcetera they have been used in order to locally create a charge imbalance which gives rise to a gradient of V and hence an electric field that will give rise to this, this coupling. So, this uh, gradient of V is of course, in the z direction and the symmetry is broken the inversion symmetry is broken in the z direction. Okay. So, this can be written in a slightly different form. So, the h is equal to um, p square over 2 m is the kinetic energy I am just adding that and now it is p cross uh, sigma dot z cap. Okay. So, this is the Hamiltonian that we write uh, this is the Rajpa term uh, and we will write it as R S O C Rajpa spin orbit coupling this is just the kinetic energy a single particle Hamiltonian is being written and if you expand it it becomes equal to p square over 2 m plus uh, these alpha and now you have a sigma x p y uh, a minus a sigma y p x okay? because it is cross product. So, it, it is written as a sigma x p y p y is the y component of the momentum of the particle and sigma y p x the sigma y couples to the x component of the momentum. And uh, so, this is the Hamiltonian this Hamiltonian can be easily solved and uh, one gets for a free particle otherwise that is p square equal to h cross square k square over 2 m uh, if the energy spectrum comes out to be equal to h cross square k square over 2 m coming from the first term and the second term gives rise to alpha h cross k. Okay. Uh, so, that term is linear so, this is the free particle dispersion and this linear correction appears uh, because of the spin orbit coupling. So, this is like a quadratic plus a linear term and if you solve for this I mean I am saying that this is very easy to solve because you know what is uh, sigma x and sigma y. So, just put them and solve a 2 by 2 matrix and this 2 by 2 matrix uh, will give rise to. So, you may want to put a, a identity here such that uh, this becomes uh, also a 2 by 2 matrix and then solve the matrix equation to find out the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors. Okay. So, there are these two eigenvalues plus and minus which are this minus sign I had missed. So, you have two uh, levels one is the, uh, the free particle energy plus 
uh, this uh, linear term and uh, there is another term which is uh, lower than that. Uh, so, this will give rise to the correction due to the spin orbit coupling and um, the two uh, you know Eigen functions and I am writing it in only in 2D is equal to exponential i uh, k x x uh, plus uh, k y y and this is 1 by root 2 1 plus minus i exponential minus i theta and uh, this theta is nothing but given by the tan inverse k y by k x. Uh, where k x and k y are related to p x and p y as p x is equal to h cross k x and so on. So, this is the complete solution of the problem. It is a single particle problem which can be solved. It is just a uh, little more uh, complicated and involved because uh, it, it has a 2 by 2 structure because of the matrices, the Pauli matrices uh, being involved into this. All right. So, let me show you the plots for the energy here. Uh, this is the 3D plot of the energy this one and this uh, shows a kx and ky are plotted along these directions and uh, the energy is plotted in the z direction. So, you see that there are like two cones, uh, one is engulfed into another and uh, so they only touch at this point and uh, very interestingly if you look at this uh, figure B here. Uh, this is the Fermi surface of these circular patches are corresponding to different uh, you know iso energy contours and if you look at any uh, point here the spin is pointing in this direction the direction that you see here whereas if you go to another point the spin is pointing in this direction here it is pointing in this direction and so on okay which means that the momentum of the electron is coupled with its spin without the spin orbit coupling you will have this it, it does not matter I mean wherever everywhere it will be pointing either up or down or in a particular direction. But here that does not happen because of the presence of a spin orbit coupling okay? and the spin and the orbits are coupled orbit means the angular momentum or the linear momentum in this particular case. Okay? So, this is the 2D plot this is the first C is without any electron uh, I mean without any spin orbit coupling. So, that is a parabolic dispersion that you all are uh, familiar with and uh, it corresponds to both up and down spins you know uh, for both up and down spins they are superposed on one another. So, you do not uh, distinguish them at all. Now, the second one is when you apply a Zeeman field. So, when you apply a Zeeman field which uh, the one type of spins uh, they get raised uh, with respect to the Fermi level and uh, so this is like that uh, mu b plus minus mu b. So, plus minus mu b kind of effect. So, one gets uh, raised uh, one type of spin. So, this down spin it gets raised and this thing falls below the Fermi level the green one which is a up spin and uh, so that is a Zeeman field. I mean as opposed to the Zeeman term you see the Rajpa term it gets uh, separated or segregated the two parabolas they get segregated laterally that is in this uh, ky direction and uh, they only intersect the red and the blue corresponding to the down and the up spins they only meet at or intersect at k equal to 0. Okay? So, this is the property of the spin orbit coupling you see there also in point a also there is uh, the uh, meet at the or rather intersect at the k equal to 0. Now, just to remind you once more that we have uh, said that for spintronic devices or to observe spin hall effect uh, there is no necessity for the spin orbit or uh, there is no necessity for an external magnetic field. But what is most important is that one should have spin orbit coupling and the spin orbit coupling better be large in order to see observable spin hall voltage. Unfortunately, it is difficult to uh, manipulate this uh, these spin orbit coupling to a very large extent to give rise to you know observable effects. But of course, with the advent of technology all these things are becoming more and more uh, 
uh, clearer that how actually this alpha quantity which we have talked about the strength of the spin orbit coupling how it can be enhanced because enhancing that will give rise to the spin selection. Now, you see that uh, the differences between the red and the green curve is because of this alpha. If alpha becomes larger, uh, these two uh, the bands that you see the parabolic bands will move farther apart. Alpha becomes very large, they move farther apart and so on. And this will tell you that uh, the strong if we go back to our plot that we have seen here. So, the more efficient spin accumulation at these edges of the sample will take place and uh, more accumulation takes place uh, at the two transverse edges uh, will give rise to a larger spin hall voltage and will eventually give rise to a, a spin hall current. Uh, our next job is to actually deliberate upon the, uh, the spin hall current and um, or, or the spin current rather uh, associated with this uh, spin hall effect and uh, then we will talk about uh, the experiments which had uh, really discovered this um, the existence of uh, spin hall effect or rather the quantized version of spin hall effect which we will call as a quantum spin hall effect. Remember once more that there is no magnetic field there had there been magnetic field there would, be, would have been a charge hall effect as well which is the usual Hall effect uh, that we have talked about so far. Uh, and uh, if you do not have a uh, magnetic field, then the time reversal symmetry is not broken. If the time reversal symmetry is not broken, then uh, the quantized Hall conductance which we have been, which we are familiar with will not come. So, the system will have a zero churn number and so on and so forth. Okay. So, we will uh, talk about the spin current and uh, from there we will talk about the a spin hall uh, conductivity.